Good afternoon from Ireland, everybody. It is my great pleasure to welcome everybody and to thank those who are joining us live and to those who will be listening in afterwards. And I'd also like to warmly welcome our guests today, whom I'll introduce shortly. Our webinar is titled, The Role of Pharmacy Professionals in Point of Care Testing. Pharmacy professionals are fully committed to an interprofessional and person-centered approach to healthcare, where the regulatory framework permits a broad range of point of care, POC, tests can be performed at community pharmacies or clinical biology laboratories. Point of care tests can provide valuable information to support health-related decision-making and reduce unnecessary presentations to general practice or emergency departments. Point of care tests may also be provided as part of a disease state management service to monitor the outcomes of treatment in people with chronic non-communicable diseases. In addition, pharmacy professionals can use POC tests to intervene and provide safe and quick pharmaceutical care in acute situations. Our speakers will explore these in further detail in this webinar. Please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Dara Connolly and I am a community pharmacist in Ireland. And I speak to you today as chair of the FIP Board of Pharmaceutical Practice. Why I'm really excited and interested in our fantastic speakers today is because they really typify what is so brilliant about FIP, bringing international best practice and knowledge of how to advance all aspects of the practice of pharmacy. And by doing so and learning from each other, I think that we can advance our own practice, whatever practice setting that might be, but also we can bring it home to the regions in which we work and in which we live. So without further ado, I'm delighted to show you the fantastic pictures of Sharif, Julien, Tressa, and Effie. And what we will do is quickly go through some housekeeping in order to make sure that we have a nice flow to our session today. So as you probably will have seen on your screens already as you have joined, that this webinar is being recorded live and live streamed via YouTube. That gives us an opportunity later to either recap or to join in from this recording, which will be on the website when the address that you can see is events.fip.org. This is a participative webinar and with such brilliant speakers, you'll want to be able to ask them questions. So we can keep a track and flow of the questions. Please use the chat box and please also introduce yourself in the chat box and make sure your name comes up so we know who we're talking to. We love feedback at FIP to make sure that we are achieving what it is you would like us to achieve. And you can do this with us by clicking on the address there, which is webinars at FIP. And really, really importantly, if you're not already a member of FIP, we want you to join with the worldwide representative organization for pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists all around the world. So please take a minute, if you're not a member of FIP, to have a look at the membership section on our website. Today's program, if I can quickly run through it, is the welcome and introduction. And then we have a presentation from Sharif, and that's going to be on the FIP statement of policy on the role of pharmacy professionals in the point of care testing. I'm then looking forward to introducing you to Julien, who will talk to us about point of care testing services, the perspective of clinical biology laboratories. Then we'll go to Teresa from Portugal, who will talk to us about the importance of point of care testing in the prevention and management of chronic non-communicable diseases, a case study from Portugal. Effie will then introduce part five, which is the importance of point of care testing in the management of acute diseases, a case study from the United Kingdom. We then move on to the questions and answers session, and then we will wrap up at point number seven. What we want everybody to be able to come away with from today is an understanding of the role of pharmacy professionals in point of care testing, the importance of providing point of care testing services, 
in the screening and management of chronic non-communicable diseases and acute situations. And also to recognize the challenges and opportunities for pharmacists in addressing point of care services. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first participant who is Sherif Gourget, who's the president of FIP Community Pharmacy Section from Canada. And uh, just so to introduce, a little, tell you a little bit more about Sharif. Sharif is a community pharmacy executive in Canada. He has extensive experience in community pharmacy practice, business, operations, regulatory frameworks, and advocacy. He is currently the CEO of On Farm United, a network of over 600 independent pharmacies in Ontario, Canada. Sharif has been an active volunteer in the profession for over 25 years, and he, so, he serves on a number of local, national, and international boards and commissions. He's a past president of the Ontario College of Pharmacists, and as I mentioned already, is the current president of the Community Pharmacy Section of FIP. Sharif, it's a pleasure to welcome you to our webinar. Thank you, Dara, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sharif Gorgi, and it is my pleasure to be here uh, with you today to give you a brief overview of FIP's policy statement uh, on point of care text, uh, testing in, um, in pharmacies. First, I would like to start by acknowledging the members of the policy uh, committee uh, and thank them for uh, their time and for their excellent contributions to uh, drafting uh, this policy statement. Uh, as you can see, we had uh, quite a diverse group of experts from different regions uh, across the world. We also had uh, representation from different sectors uh, in the profession, and uh, this was reflected uh, also in the dual chairmanship uh, of uh, this committee, uh, which represented both the, uh, the practice side and also the, the clinical side. Uh, in fact, uh, um, my co-chair, Julian Fonsar, will be speaking later today on the role of pharmacists in point of care testing uh, from a, a clinical perspective. And I'm going to start things off by giving you a general overview of the policy statement and touching on some of the operational points related to that. The new statement on the role of pharmacy professionals in point of care uh, testing updates and replaces the previous FIP statement from 2004. As a background, back in 2004, the FIP Council had adopted a statement on point of care testing, which was um, an important step at the time to support FIP member organizations in advocating for um, an emerging role for pharmacists in disease screening and monitoring. Fast forward 18 years later, both the technology of point of care tests and the scope of practice uh, for pharmacists have obviously uh, greatly uh, evolved which prompted the need to review the policy and update it. Uh, the title of the statement itself was also changed to uh, reflect the role of uh, pharmacy professionals in um, uh, point of care testing rather than the role of pharmacies. And that was to recognize that in addition to pharmacists, some jurisdictions may also authorize pharmacy technicians, pharmacy interns or pharmacy students, for example, to uh, perform those tests. And the rationale for this uh, is that the collection of the specimen from the patient is a technical task in itself, which can be performed by pharmacy professionals with the appropriate uh, training and scope, while the uh, interpretation and the clinical decisions arising from the results, as well as the communication of the results to the patient and uh, to uh, the doctor, would still be the sole responsibility of, of the pharmacist. The new statement also highlights the value of pharmacy-based point-of-care testing for individual patients and the health systems and how it must be properly recognized and compensated through fair reimbursement models. Lastly, the new statement not only reaffirms the commitment of FIP and its member organizations to expanding the role of pharmacists in primary health care, but it also provides a powerful policy tool to help advocate for advancing the practice of pharmacy and point-of-care testing and in promoting interprofessional uh, collaboration. The statement highlights the importance of providing health screening services through point of care tests, the health economic benefits of pharmacy-based testing services, 
the requirements and procedures for conducting point of care tests by pharmacy professionals and the education and training uh, that they need. Uh, the statement also includes uh, a set of recommendations addressed at the main stakeholders like governments and policymakers, FIP member organizations, pharmacy academic institutions, and individual pharmacy professionals. And I'm going to give you a brief overview of that uh, in just in a bit. Point of care testing allows pharmacists to better monitor in real time certain medical conditions for their patients, which helps to monitor their adherence to therapy and also helps them achieve better health outcomes. For example, there are tests that can measure values for hemoglobin A1C to assess for and monitor diabetes. So there are INR tests for bleeding disorders, there are lipid tests for managing cardiovascular health. And there are also point of care tests that screen for COVID-19, H. pylori, uh, hepatitis C, and HIV. One of the key benefits for point of care testing is the accessibility and convenience aspect in pharmacies. Point of care testing in pharmacies, uh, certainly in addition to uh, uh, looking at it from an accessibility perspective, it is much more accessible than uh, looking at traditional lab testing. And uh, uh, this becomes even more valuable when you look at areas, uh, remote areas where patients um, may not be able to have easy access to lab services uh, that may not be readily available. Uh, also, point of care tests are more timely than lab tests. So they, they provide immediate uh, uh, clinical information that can in turn help uh, pharmacists to help inform their patients on how to uh, better manage their, their medical uh, conditions. Um, it's also worth mentioning that point of care tests are way less invasive than lab tests and uh, most of them just require a few drops of blood which is typically done by just a simple um, uh, finger prick uh, and um, um, I think the one thing I just want to clarify here that uh, point of care testing in pharmacy uh, is not intended in any way to replace lab testing and is not intended to replace the, the patient and physician relationship um, it's just important to clarify that point uh, that uh, point of care tests are being done in pharmacies for screening purposes uh, and uh, not for diagnosis. So a good way of looking at them is to consider them as a tool uh, to triage patients to identify those that may require immediate further medical attention. And uh, when pharmacists conduct these tests, um, we uh, basically use that real-time information to help identify uh, early warning signs of uh, certain conditions. Uh, and if needed, then refer the patients accordingly uh, to uh, the most appropriate healthcare provider. That in turn helps to expand the capacity of the healthcare system by reducing unnecessary visits uh, to doctors or, or to emergency rooms. And also point of care tests help uh, pharmacists intervene uh, and provide safe and quick pharmaceutical care in acute situations as well. And that leads to faster and more appropriate patient care, uh, less disease uh, worsening, which again would benefit the public health system as a whole in terms of savings uh, in health care costs. And uh, although this is important for countries and territories at all income levels, it's obviously very important, particularly in low and middle uh, income countries, to ensure access to affordable healthcare services where there may be insufficient workforce capacity across other healthcare professions and uh, uh, other uh, access to healthcare services uh, may be uh, limited. Therefore, uh, given the uh, many uh, potential uh, benefits of point of care testing for patients and overall healthcare system, the updated policy statement sets out um, recommendations for different stakeholders in order to support and increase access to testing uh, through pharmacies. So, for example, for uh, governments, regulators, ministries of health, and policymakers, the uh, statement urges them to acknowledge that point of care testing is within pharmacy professional scope of practice and ensure that they are supported by appropriate legislation and regulations to perform such roles. The statement also recommends that they develop policies and remove regulatory barriers to enable pharmacy professionals to play a broader role in point of care testing for health screening, patient assessment, and medication management purposes. The statement also asks uh, governments and policymakers to include pharmacy professionals as part of the solution for screening strategies 
and to develop suitable and fair reimbursement models to ensure the sustainability of such services by pharmacies. The next slide, please. The policy also urges national pharmacy organizations to advocate for the necessary revision of legislation in their jurisdictions to facilitate the involvement of pharmacy in point of care testing and to advocate for fair funding and reimbursement based on the economic benefits that would accrue on the healthcare system. And also in addition to paying pharmacy professionals to conduct uh, the tests, it is also strongly encouraged for governments to fund such tests and make them free of charge for the public, at least for diseases with a significant risk of causing a pandemic or for diseases for which an early detection may avoid subsequent higher expenditure uh, by healthcare system. And we've seen that happen with uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, testing. The use of a point of care pharmacies uh, should also be supported by appropriate education and training at undergraduate and continuous professional development levels to ensure pharmacy uh, professionals have the necessary competence uh, to understand, select, and perform uh, those point of care tests and to know how to interpret the results and how to make appropriate clinical decisions. That's why the policy also recommends for education providers that pharmacy students should be provided with basic training on taking biological samples mm -hmm. and for providers of continuing professional development to create the necessary tools and training to help guide pharmacy professionals on how to best implement point of care testing in their practice. Lastly, the FIP policy statement on point of care testing recommends that individual pharmacy professionals should follow the guidelines issued by the regulatory body and ensure that they abide by any legislative requirements. The statement also outlines that pharmacy professionals should ensure they have the standard operating procedures that they need in place to cover all aspects of point of care testing, including training, uh, scope of practice, equipment, patient identification, patient consent and confidentiality, and obviously appropriate record keeping. So for example, some of those standards procedures would require that point of care tests must be performed in an environment that is clean, safe, private, and comfortable for the patient. It would also be required that the results of the tests uh, and the pharmacist's professional decision be documented and relate appropriately to uh, the um, uh, patient's uh, um, uh, physician uh, or uh, other healthcare provider. Uh, the statement also outlines that only medical uh, devices authorized by the local health authorities can be used for point of care tests and that the procedure must be in place to properly receive uh, and store those uh, devices and related supplies according to uh, the manufacturer's uh, instructions. Uh, also prior to use, uh, devices should be calibrated if required to ensure that they function properly and inventory must be monitored regularly for identification and disposal of any outdated or uh, record uh, the products. Uh, and uh, lastly, the policy outlines that individual uh, pharmacy uh, professionals should commit to the professional obligation and duty to maintain the competence, knowledge, and skills needed to safely and effectively conduct point-of-care tests. So with this policy statement, FIP uh, is leading on point of care testing and community pharmacy as a way to strengthen health systems around the world. Uh, pharmacy professionals are clearly the most accessible healthcare providers anywhere in the world, and we have the training, knowledge, and expertise to create additional capacity in the healthcare system. During the pandemic, we have clearly demonstrated our ability to safely and effectively support both lab-based and point-of-care testing strategies for COVID-19. So leveraging that ability to provide additional services and pharmacies will certainly improve access to care, and it will also increase the capacity of the healthcare system and support its long-term
Hi everyone, that is the end of Sharif's part of today's webinar. We seem to be having a small glitch with moving our slides on and introducing our next speaker. So please bear with us while we get on top of this. So here we are. Sharif, thank you on behalf of all the attendees. And I'm delighted to see that my box is telling me that we have 225 participants. And I don't know if that's a record or not, but I tell you, I, I'm delighted to see so many people involved and taking a special interest in point of care testing in pharmacy. At this point, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Julien Fonsard. I am always fascinated by Julien's area of practice in pharmacy because I work with him also in the Bureau of Pharmaceutical Practice in FIP. But let me tell you a little bit about him. He is a pharmacist, at, uh, has a doctorate, and he is a specialist in laboratory medicine. And he's the head of the core lab of the San Louis, Larry Bossier University Hospitals, the Greater Paris University Hospitals, HPHP. And he is the president of the clinical biology section of FIP and the vice president of clinical biology section of the French National Order of Pharmacists. Julian, it's my pleasure to introduce you to everybody, and we're looking forward to hearing your take on the, as the head of clinical, bio, clinical biology laboratory services. Thank you, Derek. So, dear colleagues, I will speak today about uh, the perspective of clinical biology laboratories about BOCT. After a brief introduction, I will detail the following points about well, what really means using POCT and their medical responsibility on every day in labs. But first of all, uh, there is a very interesting and recent paper I want to propose you from American Association for Clinical Chemistry from 2022 that should uh, help everyone to settle POCT across the world. Next slide, please. So let's speak about what is point of care test point of care testing, sorry, for labs. Obviously, it's closest to the patients, but it's performed by a personnel without laboratory degree or credential. And worldwide, there, is, there are many regulations about laboratory medicine exercise. Next slide, please. In fact, laboratory testing, regardless of where it, the test is conducted, so it includes POCT can be more or less regulated with requirements such as method verification, policies and procedures, operator tra training and competency, quality control, obviously, reagent supply and storage, hazardous waste, risk assessment, and many more. Next slide, please. So, what are the general benefits of POCT from a lab perspective? Sheriff already uh, highlighted some, but surely it's a better patient satisfaction and experience, such as increased patient workflow, shorter turnaround time, and delay in medical procedures, and easier sampling and transport of the samples. Continuity of care of the patient can be upgraded upgraded, sorry, by POCT, regarding counseling to the patient during the medical visit, with increase of patient compliance and reduce of the callbacks from health workers. And we can also avoid escalation of treatments, like going to the ER or hospital admission. Next slide, please. Various POCT settings can occur, as we can see on this slide. Common hospital settings like triage, ER, operating rooms, radiology, various clinics, but also laboratory settings like rapid response labs, emerging infectious disease lab, or disaster planning lab. But as we've seen during the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, we can also have non-traditional settings like airports, pharmacies, sorry, sporting events, schools, university, and that's good because that way we manage the pandemic. But we should always consider the goals of the facility and the needs of the patient population to be served by adding policy, especially with an approach of cost-benefit 
benefits analysis. Next slide, please. So testing methods should always be designed to be used with or without connectivity to the, medi to the electronic medical record of the patient. Both are very important. And testing methods, methods should always be able to lock out operators unless they meet the required compliance qualifications. Also lock out the testing methods if the quality controls requirements have not been made. Able to check specimen integrity, the quantity and the, and the quality, and track and document as much as possible. Next slide, please. With no surprise, we can see that most of the actual methods have benefits and limits. Here you can find a non-exhaustive list of examples of clinical applications, their strengths and their weaknesses. Next slide, please. So let's speak about what are POCT setup requirements and challenges. And I, and I think really they apply to every one of us. Test complexity and regulatory compliance. Depending on your country or local regulation, regulations, is the test you are planning to implement is complex or not? It can force you to have some credential or certificate to be able to practice. And some kind of exception did happen in the very recent past, like the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic with emergency use authorization of POCT. I will always say, choose wisely and ask yourself, do my personal meet the regulatory qualifications to their roles? Do I have the correct personnel properly certified to perform the, the testing? What is the complexity of the test? And if the, the testing needs cannot be satisfied by, our, by a lower complexity test, do I meet the requirements for a higher level, level of complexity testing? Next slide, please. For environment and facility needs, answer proper temperature control, lightning, humidity, air quality, water quality, and altitude also it can cause many problems with altitude. And also think about personal protective equipment in, uh, in accord to the testing methods and waste management are crucial. Facility requirements, ask yourself, will the POCT be in a shared activity space or not? Do I have the physical size available for testing? What do I need? If the, if the facility is accessible by patients or non-health personnel, what kind of measures I have to implement to maintain security of the testing equipment, their electronics, and much more the protect, uh, in order to protect the personal health information of the patient. Next patient, next slide, please, sorry. Using POCT means also method verification and instrument performance. It must be done according to the manufacturer specifications to provide objective evidence that the method is fit for its purpose and the specific intended use is full file. So you can test accuracy, precision, reference intervals, and so on, and many more. You can do a full uh, range of books about that subject. Thinking about reagents, you need to identify storage requirements in accord to the manufacturer's guidelines, answer appropriate conservation with freezer, refrigeration, room temperature, humidity, and also some kind of reagents may need to, pre to be prepared for use. So you have to get quality grade water, 
pipettes, and so on. Next slide, please. Controls on quality control as the lifeblood of clinical biology, and so they are for POCT. In order to have a proper traceability of testing lots used for patients, and to ensure that every new lot of testing device meets their requirements. And unfortunately, individual quality control plan is more and more usual in our field of activity. Or we need to have a risk assessment, a quality control plan, and a quality assessment to process and monitor the effectiveness of your quality control plan. At last, professional proficiency testing or external quality controls are common in our field, and they ensure that systems are operated accurately. Next slide, please. Documentation, documentation is crucial. Personal roles and qualifications need to be established and checked. And finally, the second pillar of clinical biology actually the so last but not the least are training and competency assessments. With regular staff competency evaluation, including on specimen collection, and a clone of knowledge of potential interference of testing methods and specimens. And specimens sorry. So to conclude, I would say what a glorious program, but most of the time it's done outside your lab, and it's so much more complex than doing, doing it inside your lab. So now, what is or what are the futures of POCT? Obviously, we have a rep rapid increase of options, actually, with trending towards patient-centered care, as we already speak about. And it was accelerated, accelerated by the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, obviously. Here we can see what is actually in the development laboratory, such like mobile wearable device, transcutaneous monitors, continuous glucose monitoring, and lab on chip. And to conclude, I will quote the ACC paper conclusion I speak about sooner. It is imperative that stakeholders collectively identify what testing is needed on which method or platform best meets the needs for patient-centered care. A team of people should be involved and the success of future POCT relies on partnering, with, on partnering for investigation, implementation, and monitoring quality over time. Thank you. Julian, that was fascinating to see the perspective from the laboratory. And there was so much information for many of us who don't have pharmacists working in that role in their country. So thank you very much for your expertise and for sharing them. Our next speaker, our next expert is Grace Torres from Portugal. And she's going to talk to us about the importance of point of care testing in the prevention and management of chronic non-communicable diseases through a case study from Portugal. Since 2011, Teresa has been actively involved in the implementation of pharmacy services and alternative funding models, namely through partnerships with health insurance companies and local and regional government. As part of the Portuguese pharmacy's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, she worked on the implementation, funding and monitoring of COVID-19 testing in pharmacies. Her responsibilities include liaising with local and regional authorities, development of guidelines and relevant information to support pharmacies practice, regulatory and funding framework, communication and advocacy activities. Currently, she is the CEO of GoFAR, a joint venture between ANF and Agias Group with the aim to combine the know-how of the provider and the funder in order to promote primary proximity care through the intervention of pharmacies and models of collaboration between health professionals. So it's all yours. 
Thank you, Dara. Um, so let me just, can you hear me well? So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, uh, as Dara was saying, I'm a pharmacist and today I will try to give you a short overview of the Portuguese experience uh, with point of care testing. Um, and to give you some extra context, uh, uh, I am the general director of GoFAR. Uh, GoFAR is a joint venture between the insurance company Medis from AJAS Group and the National Portuguese Pharmacists. This is a very young partnership. Uh, we were born only in 2018 um, with a mission to provide uh, and to combine the know-how of the provider and the funder. We want to extend uh, health services in the Portuguese pharmacies, mostly in areas such as disease prevention, screening, early detection, and monitoring of chronic diseases. So as this said, if you could just uh, pass the slide, Inês. Um, it's, I will now just give you an uh, overview of our pharmacy network in Portugal. So, Portugal has a network of 2,745 pharmacies affiliated with INF, so it's about 94% of the Portuguese pharmacies, with an average of 3.7 pharmacies per pharmacy, pharmacists per pharmacy, Portuguese pharmacies have a balance of distribution through the territory, giving equity in access to medicines and to pharmaceutical services. With this capacity, uh, pharmacies are well positioned to offer POCT as they are widely accessible with many located in small communities and they are staffed with trained professionals who can provide advice and support patients. Additionally, uh, many pharmacies are equipped with the necessary technology and supplies to perform POCT, uh, which makes them a convenient and, of course, cost-effective cost -effective alternative to hospitals or clinics. On the next slide, uh, I will just give you um, a briefly uh, overview about our healthcare system. Um, and some basic points. Uh, the health system in Portugal is supported by several players. The major one, the, nation, the National Health Service, our NHS, uh, is the, um, it, it's the, the major funder and it's universal and mainly free. It's with universal and mainly free access. Then we have some special and public social health insurance, and they are only for certain professions. And of course, to complement that, we have the private voluntary health insurance. Today, and especially after the pandemic, uh, these public and private funders must face challenges in order to ensure these values of access, equity, and social solidarity. These challenges are not very different from other European countries, and they can be basically divided into demographic and economic challenges, like uh, low birth rate, uh, population aging and economic pressure on public spending and social benefits. So we need to face these challenges and bring new opportunities uh, and solutions to our healthcare system. On the next slide, I will just give you, as I was saying, um, a view of the demographic problems that we are facing. So uh, Portugal, as I was, I, I was saying, uh, an aging population uh, with one million Portuguese over 75 years old. Uh, and of course, with old age naturally comes um, more uh, non-communicable diseases, for example, and I will focus on cardiovascular disease and diabetes, which are major public health issues here in Portugal, as they are in many other countries. Uh, it is estimated that diabetes affects 13.6% of the population uh, and which 44, only 44 are un unaware of having the disease. So people don't know that they have diabetes and about 2 million have hyperglycemia or prediabetes. 
Risk factors for these diseases include high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking, physical inactivity, uh, and a diet, our beloved uh, Portuguese diet, uh, that is high in salt, sugar, and fat. So the numbers ab about Portugal show that hypertension affects 36% of Portuguese people, 57% of the Portuguese population is overweight, and as for cholesterol, 63.3% uh, of Portuguese have high levels of cholesterol. So on the next slide, and to address this uh, issue and these problems, um, the Portuguese pharmacy network provides access to point of care for a long time now. This is a vital tool uh, in the everyday prevention and management of chronic diseases because it promotes, uh, as we are just so uh, concerned about um, faster diagnose and capacity to monitor the, these conditions. All over the country, uh, pharmacies provide point of care testing for cardiovascular diseases by measuring cholesterol, for example, and diabetes by monitoring blood sugar uh, levels. Patient can do this all over the country, uh, which helps to promote adherence, uh, medication, and reduce control and prevent complications. However, these services are not reimbursed by the NHS uh, and they are not integrated with doctors of the NHS. Only a few private health insurance companies cover these services in, in pharmacies. On the next slide, uh, and so in order to, to evolve in this matter, uh, I would like to tell you about a program we held here in Portugal from July 27 to October 2020. Um, and with this experience uh, that was placed in the municipality of Condomar in the north of Portugal, our target was people above 45 years old without, of course, diabetes. And our aim was to identify and diagnosed people and referral them to the doctor. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, the assistant doctor of the insurance company, as we did this uh, through our joint venture. To identify these people, pharmacies did POC tests for glycated uh, hemoglobin, uh, and complemented these tests by a risk assessment questionnaire, defined risk. On the next slide, I will show you the patient journey. So it was a long patient journey uh, and the, it was uh, integrated uh, as a model. So it was an integrated care model with doctors from the insurance company. So the medish assistant doctor, that's the name, uh, and the clinical laboratories. So in the pharmacy, pharmacists have the role to identify people uh, at higher risk of type 2 diabetes by applying uh, the questionnaire and the point of care tests to evaluate the blood sugar levels. After that, with the patient consent, uh, if levels were high, the pharmacy had a free way uh, to schedule an appointment with the medis assistant doctor. And then the doctor will ask for more clinic analysis and or start treatment if needed. So, the pharmacy at here have the role to POC test, but of course we wanted to um, ensure that all professionals have their place. And we know that um, this kind of test in the pharmacy need to be in collaboration always with the doctor, so that it could be uh, the person could be um, really treated for the disease that he or may, that he may or may not have on the moment. So on the next slide, I will show you some results of this experience. So most of the people that uh, were, treat, were uh, in this program were women, uh, and they were on an average age of 62 years old. On the next slide, you can see that uh, although 73.8% uh, of the patients were overweight, uh, or obese, uh, it is very interesting to see that 84% claims to eat fruits or vegetables on a daily basis, and 52.9% said to be physical act physically active. Um, almost half of them have hypertension and more than a half history of diabetes in the family. On the next slide, 
you can uh, see that the point of care testing test in this case identified and referred 94 cases to the medis assistant doctor and on the next slide uh, some big numbers you know like one in 10 uh, of these people uh, were in need of medical care four in 10 was uh, was in need of adopting prevention life scale, uh, lifestyle changes and 100% of screen users who finished the patient's journey uh, were uh, diagnosed with diabetes because and this is a, a note that I want to give you you know not all people finish the the, the, the patient's journey a lot of them uh, failed the the first or the second doctor appointment and this is another issue that we need to um, acknowledge that when we first diagnose someone we do not know what happens next so we need to guarantee that they are uh, being followed with some professional and that the doctor wants to um, be with person and ensure that he's going to do the treatment on the next slide so just to conclude, POCT is a critical tool in the prevention and management of chronic non-communicable diseases. And by providing access through pharmacies, point of care tests improve patient outcomes, reduce healthcare costs and increase patient satisfaction. Patients can receive convenient NCD testing in their local communities, uh, which saves them time and money. It's easier for patients to manage their diseases and improves adherence to treatment. Uh, reducing the number of hospitals, admissions, and other healthcare costs associated with NCDs, uh, POC helps to make healthcare more accessible for all citizens. And with um, you know, we did this program uh, in 2020, so it was. Um, COVID pandemic um, was a, a very issue. Uh, so, and we were working in another things that didn't were now on this uh, moment so important for us. You know, we were all dealing with COVID. So uh, we believe that now it's more than time to um, continue this project and move forward to a national level, not just only on that particular municipality, but in other municipalities uh, and move to a national level with the involvement of the NHS. And I think uh, it, that was what I wanted to share with you today. Tracy, that was fascinating. And it led so smoothly from Julian's perspective as from the clinical and the laboratory perspective to seeing how this is working in chronic disease so effectively in Portugal. So congratulations to both of you. Uh, that brings me on to our third expert today. And this brings us nicely into moving beyond the clinical and the laboratory moving beyond chronic care, but also looking at a unique perspective, I think, of acute care. So we want to introduce Effie. Effie is going to talk to us about the importance of point of care testing in the management of acute diseases. And this is going to be a case study from the United Kingdom. So please allow me to introduce Effie Mansurane. She's an academic pharmacist and registered practitioner with expertise in reflective practice and practice-based learning. Her research relates to technology-enabled provision of pharmacy services. She has provided an evidence base to health boards in Wales and the Welsh government for commissioning of pharmacy services which have transformed professional practice. Her areas of interest include electronic prescribing, the discharge medicines service, and integration of GP and pharmacy patient records. In the last few years, she has been focusing on evaluating the first NHS funded sore throat test and treat community pharmacy service in the United Kingdom. Effie, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to our webinar. Yours is the floor. Thank you very, very much. Um, and thanks for the invitation. Um, so I will talk to you today about um, another example 
of how point of care testing can be used in community pharmacies um, and another proof of concept, um, I'm hoping. And I will use a case from within the United Kingdom this time. And when I say from the United Kingdom, um, I will be a bit more specific and I will um, talk about Wales, which is where um, I am based. So Wales is one of the four um, nations that make up the, um, the United Kingdom. And um, because health is one of the devolved powers in the United Kingdom, um, in Wales, we have our own health minister and we have control over what is happening in our national um, health service. So we can commission our own services. So um, for a long time now, there has been a wider government policy to sift the management of many common ailments, either to self-care or to professionals other than general practitioners. And one such strategy has been to better utilize the skills of community pharmacists in managing these acute minor ailments. So about 10 years ago, the local government started funding the Common Ailment Scheme. And under this scheme, um, patients with any of a list of 26 common ailments can get assessed in their community pharmacy, and if appropriate, um, they can receive the appropriate treatment free of charge. Sore throat has been one of these common ailments since the start of the scheme, um, but no antibiotics could be supplied. So um, if a pharmacist thought that a patient would benefit from an antibiotic, they had to refer patients to, um, to the GP. It also meant that many patients preferred to go um, and see the GP directly if they thought that they needed an antibiotic um, in the first place. But we need to remember um, that it is quite tricky to differentiate the viral um, or bacterial etiology of a sore throat based on just a clinical assessment, whether that's done by a pharmacist or a GP. And for this reason, um, back in 2018, the government decided to um, commission a pilot of a national sore throat test and treat service. Um, initially in just 56 pharmacies in two areas of Wales. And in Wales, we have a total of about 720 community pharmacies. So even though this was only um, a subset of the pharmacies, it was quite large to allow us to, um, to see what's happening with the service. So the service adopted um, a staged test and treat strategy and it included, it was, it was offered to all patients aged six years and over, presenting um, with acute sore throat at any of these 56 community pharmacists. Um, the first step, a pharmacist was um, screening the patients just to ensure there, are, there were no red flags that would mean um, the patient had to be referred immediately to emergency services. And after that, um, validate tools, either the fever pain or to, um, to support identification of bacterial infection. The choice of scoring method um, was left to the pharmacist. And just to say that all pharmacies were um, thoroughly trained for um, providing the service, including um, training on throat examination, use of scoring tools, and sampling using um, a throat swab. And patients who um, met the threshold scores based on the guidelines, officially published guidance, um, and that is a fever pain score of two and above, um, or center three and above, were then offered a point of care test in the pharmacy, allowing pharmacists to quickly screen against the presence of Streptococcus um, A, which is one of the main um, bacterial causative um, organisms of acute sore throat. Um, this first step of clinical scoring allowed targeting testing um, of those most likely 
to have um, a Streptococcus A infection rather than asymptomatic um, carriers. Patients who didn't meet the threshold scores for point of care test um, received self care, which essentially um, is what they would have normally be offered under the traditional common ailment scheme. And um, just to note that only evidence based symptomatic treatment was considered under the scheme, and that was um, paracetamol or ibuprofen. For those patients who uh, would benefit from a point of care test that was conducted in the pharmacy in a private consultation room by the pharmacists, and we had um, minimum criteria for sensitivity and specificity. And remember that was um, before the pandemic where, um, where suddenly we started to realize how important um, that is. So the specific test we used for the pilot had sensitivity of 96% and specificity of um, 98%. And um, the third step, which is what happened next, um, really, really exemplified um, the role that the pharmacies could play with patient education. Because as, um, as we know, the evidence is that even bacterial Streptococcus A infections are self-limiting and they tend to go away in three to five days. Um, so even when the result of the point of care test was positive, patients don't actually have to take the antibiotics. And the whole idea was that they made a joint decision with the pharmacist after there was um, a conversation about risks versus benefits. If they decided they wanted to take an antibiotic, a supply was provided in the pharmacy without the need for the patient to um, go to the GP afterwards. When the point of care test result was negative, then no antibiotics were offered. Um, and again, the evidence was explained um, and self-care was discussed. Um, linking back to Julian's presentation, um, just to note that this service aligned with some of the recommendations that um, were discussed. So the pharmacist, we said we mentioned accredited, um, some responsibilities were clearly in a document um, that we call, and so everybody at any point knew, um, and also, with the patients were documented on an electronic system so um, we could check patient outcomes. Um, you can see here on this slide um, the services aims and all arising from the goal of safe transfer of care of uncomplicated sore throats to community pharmacy. So the service aimed to increase collaborative working within primary care, to ease workload pressures from GP surgeries and out of our settings, whilst at the same time improving um, antimicrobial stewardship by supplying antibiotics only when clinically appropriate, and also by educating patients so that they understand the difference between um, viral and bacterial infections and the self-limiting nature of the latter. So did the service um, achieve its aims? The data that I'm going to present to you um, is between November 2018, which is when the pilot was introduced, and September 2019, so about 10 months worth of data. Um, when patients um, were asked what they would have done had the service not been available, almost 93% of them said they would have made an appointment with a GP. A further 3% said that they would have gone to an out of hours or um, accident and emergency setting. Small percentage, you would say, but within the space of the 10 months, that was 132 appointments. 
the antibiotic supply rate was approximately 20%. So only about a fifth of patients who consulted in the pharmacy ended up with an antibiotic. And when we asked patients and we involved more than um, 500 patients in the evaluation, pretty much everyone was satisfied with the service itself, the way it was delivered by pharmacists, and the increased options for consulting with the healthcare professional that it offered. An important note as well, that we had about 40 patients that even though they met all the criteria for receiving a supply of antibiotics, they decided to self-care after discussion with the pharmacists. And how about collaborative working? How were we doing there? The actual um, source of referral for the patients um, was GP surgeries, 56%, and a further 4% was referred by practitioners in other healthcare settings. And when we conducted interviews with pharmacists, they also talked about collaborative working in their day-to-day -day interactions. And they also highlighted that um, the point of care test um, was a very powerful tool to support their decisions around supply of antibiotics or not, and to communicate those decisions to the patients. There was also um, a cost benefit analysis that was conducted by um, Health Technology Wales, and that concluded that the service was cost effective. So that's another um, a really important factor when we consider services that incorporate point of care testing. Some more recent evidence about the specific role of point of care test, um, this time from, from the pandemic, where um, we had to adjust the service delivery model and the requirement for point of care testing was relaxed. It was left up to the pharmacy's professional judgment to decide whether they will complete it or not. And even though this wasn't the model we, um, we went for to start with, it did provide us with an ideal opportunity to compare the two models, pre-COVID with point-of-care test and during COVID, where point-of-care um, was not compulsory. So what we found was that um, for the patients who pre-pandemic met those threshold scores for point of care test, the use of that test actually spurred up to 36 courses of antibiotics for every 100 um, patients. This increased to 47 courses for patients with higher clinical scores. So what that tells us is that point of care test, in addition to clinical scoring um, and examination, is the optimal pathway. And as a note, we have reverted back to this in Wales, and um, we have done for months now. And some more um, recent evidence, just to show the role of point of care test. This is our most recent study over a period of 16 months of the service with more than 11,000 consultations. Of people who uh, met the threshold scores, for point of care test, 71% tested negative um, in the test. So many of these people were potentially the supply of antibiotics. Um, so again, we can see that this is really, really um, working and point of care test really has an added value. So if we go back to the aims of the service, what the data shows us is that the current model of the service with an integrated point of care test is highly acceptable for patients and for pharmacists, is safe and cost effective, and has the role in promoting antibiotic stewardship. Thank you very much. Now, Effie, thank you very much. Uh, I'm experiencing difficulty with my uh, 
internet connection, so I can only apologize. Hopefully people can hear me. Can you hear me? I hope you can. Good. Thanks, Effie. Right. It's going to be a little bit difficult now for me to do because I've lost I've lost my track on my slide. So if I could ask for the next slide, please. Okay, uh, colleagues, I have seen some fascinating questions come through already in the chat box. So if you're not familiar with the chat box, you can find it down on the bottom and it gets highlighted every time somebody asks a question. Uh, please keep your questions coming and we will be able to have a round table now with our fantastic contributors. Uh, also, when you're asking a question, have a little scan through the questions that have already been asked and just see maybe does yours add to it or take from it or is there a new question that you might like to ask? So we might get ahead with that now. So if I could uh, move us on, let's let's get going on the questions and answers. I think the other thing I'd like to compliment the uh, contributors on is the four of them have kept very much to their time and we haven't run over, so we do have time. So this is super. Okay, I'm going to jump out for a minute and try and log back on because I can't access the, 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 the chat. So maybe if, if I could hand it over to you or one of the other contributors, if you can see a question that you might like to answer, you might get the ball rolling and I'm going to leave and I'm going to try and join back in again. Okay, so I'll leave you to it for a minute. So if I can start by answering a question that has been um, put on the Q&A, um, what happens when the Wales pharmacist, uh, in collaboration with the patient, prescribes an antibiotic? Does the pharmacist advise the patient's GP that an antibiotic was prescribed by the pharmacist to treat the throat condition? Um, so the answer is yes. Um, all consultations for the Common Ailment Scheme are recorded on a platform, a national platform that we have in Wales in community pharmacies and all outcomes of the consultations are sent electronically to the GP um, and are linked to the patient's record. So um, if that pace, same patient goes to the GP within 15 minutes, really, um, the GP can log on to their record and they can see that um, there has been a consultation with a pharmacist and what happened in that consultation. Um, and there was another question about requirements for physical conditions in the pharmacy. So the requirement is that there is a private consultation room. And this is not just for this service. It is for all services provided in um, community pharmacies. And this is for privacy, um, confidentiality for the patients, but also um, our um, national platform, the software that I talked about, um, you can only install it on a computer in a private room because only the pharmacist can log in um, to that. So it can't be exposed to any any other patients or, or members of staff. So that's the only requirement for physical conditions. Okay, thanks Effie. I am back with you, but unfortunately, because I went out, my chat has lost, so I can't see any of the questions, unfortunately. So not only having worked you so hard as four brilliant contributors, I'm now going to work you even harder and ask you to have a look through the chat to see other questions that you could answer. Uh, I would probably like to start with you, Sharif, because one I do remember is coming from a colleague in Pakistan who wished to know how about how do you, do you go about setting up remuneration for the services that are available and maybe what is the difference between what can be done in a first in a country like Canada in comparison maybe to where the colleague is from in Pakistan. Sure thanks Darren and this is a great question because obviously one of the key things that um, we, we keep uh, uh, talking about not just with point of care uh, testing but with the uh, our expanded scope in general is that we have to have the scope with reimbursement 
uh, that, that's the fundamental point in all our, our conversations with those policymakers and with government is basically help us help you. We can uh, we can help you save uh, healthcare uh, costs. We can help you expand the capacity of the healthcare system. But at the end of the day, uh, there must be fair and equitable remuneration uh, for for the services uh, provided. Uh, so uh, with that, I think this applies on, uh, for for everyone across the world uh, and. Um, it, we know that early detection of uh, health conditions and monitoring of, of treatment outcomes through point of care testing will certainly have a lot of significant therapeutic benefit. It will increase the capacity of the healthcare system. It will save the healthcare, uh, healthcare system uh, 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 money by uh, avoiding to have conditions to go uh, untreated or, or, uh, or getting complicated. Um, so with that, uh, we... Um, we have to make the case for ourselves to uh, ask for uh, uh, both the private payers and with the government to uh, make sure that point of care testing is included in, in, in their plans. Uh, and also let's not forget that uh, in the event that this doesn't happen, uh, we, have to, um, we, have, we have to charge for that service. We can charge for that service. Uh, and um, uh, there can, whatever that fee may be, this will depend on uh, on each jurisdiction and uh, uh, the level of uh, what uh, would seem to be uh, uh, reasonable and fair based on the the uh, the pharmacist's um, uh, uh, salaries time and and all of that. Uh, the 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 only issue with that is. Uh, um, if we don't have any coverage for it at all, and we only charge people for it, uh, given the, the value that uh, we get from early detection of, uh, of certain conditions and the, the value from having uh, immediate uh, or convenient access to care, this may risk creating a two-tiered system with respect to patient access to healthcare. So uh, that's that's a concern that we again we would would not want to have uh, uh, in uh, in the healthcare system anywhere in the world. And um, that's why, for example, in Ontario, uh, we we have the point of care testing scope of practice, but um, uh, we just got that about six months ago for certain um, uh, specific uh, uh, tests and conditions, but uh, there is no remuneration. So the Ontario Pharmacist Association is uh, proposing uh, to the government now to have a demonstration project uh, where we can help them to see how uh, we can close the gaps in the healthcare system, how we can save them money both in the short term uh, through early detection, also in, in, the, in the long run as well. And with the goal that this would help to inform the development of, um, of a more robust publicly funded program. So I think, you know, that's, I mean, overall, there is work that needs to be done uh, from, uh, uh, from all our ends. And, and uh, we have, um, I think maybe the message here is we, uh, if it doesn't happen, we should not wait for it to happen. We should try to go to uh, both the, the public and private payers and see uh, how, how, again, how, how we can help you. Let's have a demonstration project and so on. Thanks, Shiri. That's yeah, that's a really good answer. There's a lot to consider there. I certainly know that as we talk to pharmacists and FIP around the world, we are all really, really keen to expand our scope of practice so we can do more for the communities that we serve. But we... Julian, if I might bring you in at, at this point, we can expand our capacity because the science of point of care testing is so much closer to the healthcare practitioner and is now so much closer to the patient. If you were to talk to somebody in a country where this is not already an established practice in community pharmacy, are there any particular areas from the clinical biology perspective that you think are easier to engage with as compared to others, whether that be acute medicine, acute conditions or chronic conditions? Uh. That's a complex, complex question. Uh, there's no obvious answer. Uh, it depends on what the patient needs. Yes, what the patient needs and what uh, kind of test he needs also. So 
speak with your the GP, speak with your friends in who are healthcare professionals, speak with your labs to to provide the, the best POCT. Super. Thank you, Julian. Teresa, if I could bring you in there, your experience in Portugal was, I, I thought, very all-encompassing because not only were you talking to government, who would be a particular provider in most countries, you were also talking to health insurance companies. So when you were having conversations with these providers, do you think that they had different perspectives and things that they thought were different priorities for them when it came to point-of-care testing? Uh, yes, I think they have different perspectives, uh, especially uh, when you are talking about insurance companies and the national government, not as much as the, lo as the local government. Um, you know, when you are talking about with the insurance company, they, they at least here in Portugal, uh, we feel that they um, make more uh, business analysis so they are more uh, interested in making money actually so because they are companies uh, so uh, they do not uh, do things to lose money they do things to make money that's that's the truth uh, so when they see this on this way they do things that sometimes um, with our national health services uh, people do not look uh, they are uh, more concerned uh, with uh, uh, social solidarity, which it's the base of our national health uh, system, and it's very important for us. But you need to talk to them uh, and to know the needs of these players uh, and to adopt the services that you are uh, going to implement um, with these uh, views that they, they need. You know, um, and uh, if if you are talking about local, it's even more different because when you are talking with the local governments, they know the people, they know the needs they have. Uh, so um, it's actually sim more simple, uh, more easy to talk to local governments. And here in Portugal, we are we try to do that first, and we are doing this um, the, this journey too. We are talking a lot with the local governments, and uh, only. After that, we are going to the national ones, and it's been working for us uh, because people they know they know the people and they know the needs they have. That makes very good sense, doesn't it? Would it be easy if all policy applications was 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 as smooth flowing as that? I could see Julian agreeing with you there when you started talking about identifying what the local needs might be. So that might be a good time to bring in Effie and say. Somebody just didn't all of a sudden decide that people had sore throats in Wales and they wouldn't have uh, sore throats on the other side of the Severn Bridge. Can you give us a little bit of background? And, you know, I'd be fascinated to know from a country, uh, Ireland probably has about the same population as Wales, maybe give or take. But if I were that person going to the funder, be it an insurance company or be it more likely to be a government and to say, look, we can give you really good value for money. And again, thank you for explaining that the healthcare is devolved within the four nations of the United Kingdom. How would you start that conversation, Effie, for people listening in around the world to the webinar to say, I'd like to see this happening in pharmacies in my country? Well, I would provide them with the evidence, really. Um, and we have got evidence from a range of different angles now. Uh, it's not just the data and the patient outcomes, it's the, um, the cost, it's patient satisfaction, it is collaborative working, um, and it is establishing pharmacists as a healthcare professional who can provide more um, and they can provide more. And I think for, um, for a pharmacy professional of the future, we really need to recognize their value and they have so much to offer in, in the modern healthcare systems. Um, the GP primary care healthcare provision is just, it's saturated, it's collapsing and we need to support our colleagues to do what they can do best. 
Um, so why don't we do what we can do best? Um, and triaging in such a setting when we have actual tools helping us and managing these uncomplicated conditions is, is really something we can do. Um, so, yeah, I think follow the oh, evidence super, would be um, my answer. Yeah, your answer is perfect. And it's a little bit better than it's something we can do. It's something that you are doing. So that is the learning for colleagues around the world, whether they be in Ireland or wherever else they might be, is that the evidence exists. And I suppose by participating with FIP with webinars like this as well, you've ready access to that evidence to be able to say, hang on a second, this is, this is happening. Very specifically for you, FA, Ronald Goose has asked us a question and it's, does the... Uh, Oh, I lost it. Hang on. The question was, tell us a little bit about the communication. You talked about collaborative healthcare, and also you talked about the saturation points that exist for you in Wales. But I'm hearing them from all over the world that primary care is saturated and we need to work better collaboratively. Could you give us a little bit of detail about how that collaborative working happens? And Ronald's question seemed to be particularly around how does the GP know when a pharmacist has prescribed, or maybe not even prescribed, antibiotics in your point of care testing service? Yes, so um, I briefly touched upon that, um, Dara. Um, we have, so in Wales, we have an organization that's called Digital Health and Care Wales. Um, and 10 years ago, they developed a national infrastructure, which is what's called Choose Pharmacy. And it's a software, a platform um, where that's installed in all community pharmacies and all community pharmacy services are being recorded on that platform. So common ailment scheme, flu vaccinations, emergency contraception, um, independent prescribing service, everything's being recorded on that platform. And at the end of every consultation, um, an electronic consultation summary is transmitted to the patient's GP surgery. Um, and this is transmitted as a letter and it gets added on the patient's um, record and um, as would, for example, results from a hospital appointment. Uh, it's the same process. And this is done real, real time. Um, so if there's a referral or if, say the patient wants to see the, the GP straight away, um, the GP can literally, with a click of a button, see the outcome of the consultation. And that is in the specific service, whether the patient met the threshold criteria in the first place, if they met the criteria, what was the outcome of the test, and whether the patient has been provided with any medication, paracetamol, ibuprofen, or antibiotics. So, um, there is there are communication channels there. That sounds like a very good system, doesn't it, for everybody involved? And I think what I like the sound of it most is that it's very patient centered, isn't it? That the patient has choice, and that the patient has access. Julian, on a on a different uh, level, you might be able to shed some light. We have young pharmacists out there who are in schools of pharmacy and they're learning about expanded scope. They're learning things that I certainly didn't learn when I was in the School of Pharmacy a long time ago. Do you see that there needs to be more involvement of students of pharmacy in point of care testing? Or do you think that it's open for all of us in our continuing professional development? I think both. Uh, students need to be sensibilized to POCT and uh, active pharmacists need to, to learn about it and also and to keep learning because it's going fast, very fast about the methods or the technologies involved. Actually, you can uh, have POCT with uh, molecular biology in your pharmacies or and uh, tomorrow you will add, we will find uh, lab on chips and things like that. So yeah. don't uh, be careful and uh, don't follow uh, what the manu 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 sorry, manufacturer says. Learn 
read and uh, ask your colleagues. Sheriff, if I, if I could bring you in there, we have seen lots of things happening in Canada where pharmacists are expanding their scope. On a day-to-day -day basis through the generations of pharmacists, are you seeing a good take-up within community pharmacy of new services, but particularly in places where point-of-care testing is available? Are pharmacists willing and able? Do they have the capacity? Do they, do they want to improve their scope to do more? I think, um, uh, there again, and this is a, a good and timely question. Um, I, I would say that based on everything we've seen coming out of the pandemic, we've shown that we do have not only the, uh, the skill and knowledge, but also the, the willingness to, uh, to be able to step up and, and to be able to do more, again, with, uh, with, with fair and equitable uh, reimbursement. I can just give you a quick uh, example. Uh, we, in, in Ontario, we've had um, uh, an expanded scope of practice to uh, assess and prescribe for minor ailments. This was just about six weeks ago. It came into effect January 1st. And since then, we've had over 40,000 assessments conducted in, in Ontario pharmacies. That's 40,000 over six weeks period. I would say that that would answer your question. So we we, we certainly uh, are, are are willing and, and ready. We want to have further expansion of scope to be able to help expand the capacity of the healthcare system. And again, uh, I don't think we can over communicate this with, with fair and equitable reimbursement. I, 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 I like the way you use the phrase fair and equitable because so much of what we want to be able to do as pharmacists is to give fair and equitable access to healthcare to the communities that we serve. So we're aware that in countries where there are different models, it can be sometimes it's a copay which is uh, holding people back. And in other places, it can seem the actual capacity of primary care to look after people can, can be different within that. Teresa, we saw that there was very high satisfaction ratings from the people who access the services in community pharmacies, not only in Portugal, but I know it's true in Ireland and we saw it from Wales as well. When you go and you talk to rolling out these services as, as GoFAR and working with AJS, are you seeing people more involved in looking for services from their community pharmacies or do you still think number one is to go to the GP? Um. Every day, I think the, we are evolving uh, on that way. I think that um, and with the pandemic and uh, the role that the pharmacies had in the COVID, um, a lot of people are beginning to go uh, first to the pharmacy. Um, because, you know, uh, it was uh, a tendency, okay? A lot of people were beginning to first go to the pharmacy and after that to the GP, but uh, after the pandemic numbers are rising uh, because we did uh, actually uh, a lot of proximity with people uh, and we are working on it uh, every day. So yes, uh, I think that this is something that will evolve um, in, the next, uh, in the next years a lot. Okay. Teresa, this, I think, just by finishing up, because we're coming to the, 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 the end of our webinar. I think that's a very nice way to leave it. What I will do now is to uh, thank our contributors, Efe, Teresa, Sharif, and Julian. And what I would like everybody to do is, and I'm seeing very, very positive feedback in the chat. I'd like everybody just to take a minute when you leave, you'll be asked a few questions by FIP, about the quality and the content of the webinar that you've just engaged with. And please, please leave, leave some feedback, whether it's good or whether it's, it's something different. Finally, please, please, if you're not already a member of FIP, become a member and join us and join us fully and, and wholeheartedly so we can make sure that we're advancing pharmacy worldwide. Ladies and gentlemen, all over 200 of you, I want to thank you for your participation, for your questions. And again, also to the fantastic contributors who worked really, really hard to get everything and moving uh, on time uh, and making for a really, really informative session. 
I know it's one we're going to come back to. So thanks, everybody, and have a wonderful afternoon, morning, evening, and night. The last thing then is, I hope to see you all in Brisbane at the 81st FIP World Congress of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, which is themed Pharmacy Building a Sustainable Future for Healthcare and Aligning Goals. You'll find a lot more information about that by using the QR code or going on to the FIP website. Also, you'll be able to access the Pharmacy Education Journal. Thanks, everyone.